tell you that I'm, I was told to be serious about the introduction part. So this is supposed to be as elementary as possible, and which means that quite a few people will probably be, uh, will be very bored by this, but such is life. So, and this is a series of three talks, and uh, the first talk today will, uh, I'll just try to formulate geometric Langlands conjecture for, in the simplest possible case for the group GLN, then tomorrow I'll get a chance to talk about other groups and also say something about the properties uh, of this uh, geometry, of the geometric Langlands conjecture. And then on the last day of the workshop, I will actually, well, I, uh, I mean, the one way to call it is that it's something like towards the proof, but really it's more towards the statement. That in fact, the first two days will be what could be called the naive version of the geometric Langlands conjecture, which means that the spirit will be there, but the statements, I will not be able to make precise statements, and so only near the end. I will be able to say something about what the, how do you actually fix the problems and hopefully, and how you can hope to prove the conjecture. All right, now, so let me start on the GLN case. So what is the geometric Langlands conjecture? And um, let me fix the convention, so X is going to be a compact Riemann surface. And if you like to think algebraically, you can also think about it as a smooth projective curve over field, the field of complex numbers. In fact, to begin with, you can just work over any field. But at some point, and I hope not to forget to tell you when, it will be important that the field has zero characteristic. So, and like many things, including, I guess, duct tape, there are two sides to the uh, geometric Langlands conjecture, and they have different names. So there's the automorphic side. I'm going to call them the automorphic side and the Galois side. And so the conjecture is really the correspondence between two very different kinds of objects that already appeared earlier today. So you're supposed to have something related to, I guess, well, to the Galois group and something related to Adele's. And so let me start with the automorphic side. So automorphically, my, I want to study Let me just call it bun. And this vector bundles on my Riemann surface. So this is, I guess, technically I can write this as bun GLN X. So these are rank N uh, vector bundles on X. And now I want to think about all this geometrically from this nice point of view, but it's good to keep in mind that there are somehow classical ancestors for most of the statements here. So classically, maybe somehow more visually, the problem would be as follows. Now let's suppose that X is actually a curve over 
over a finite field. And so I'm interested in the, if you like, you can say I'm studying the field of functions, which would be a, well, a function field, a very natural object. And then this, I can look at vector rank n uh, vector bundles on my curve. This will be a discrete set, and uh, I'm interested in doing, you can say, functional analysis on it. So I'm looking at functions, say, with values in complex numbers. That's a vector space. I want to understand it, say, by constructing different bases in this vector space. So, um, so this is what would happen classically. So I would study atomorphic forms. All right. Now, since now that this geometric part comes into play, so I'm going to um, change things around, upgrade things, I guess. So the more geometrically, on this, on the atomorphic side of the uh, geometric Langlands conjecture, my goal is to look at, instead of functions, I will be looking at D modules on um, space of uh, vector bundles. So this is my atomorphic object of interest. And so, more specifically here, you can say that I'm actually interested in the space of functions more than in individual functions. Similarly, geometrically, I would look at the category of D modules on, um, uh, on the space of bundles. Now, let me make a couple of remarks about this and hopefully also clarify maybe some uh, words. So, first of all, again, hopefully I will point out um, when it becomes important. It's, so when you say bundles on a, um, say, on a Riemann surface, on an algebraic curve, uh, there are you know, you can start looking for parameters, trying to parameterize such objects, and there are many ways to view these questions and many ways to answer it. For example, you can look at the moduli space of semi-stable bundles or something like this. So it turns out that in this story, it's important to look, study all bundles. Like, you cannot restrict to semi-stable bundles only. So, for instance, if x is p1 and then is equal to 2, and let's even say you look at degree zero uh, vector bundles, you cannot just look at O plus O. You have to look at all uh, different things like O n plus O of minus n, no matter how unstable it gets. So what this means is that I cannot work with uh, GIT moduli space of bundles. I actually have to work with this gadget as an algebraic stack. So this has to be has to be viewed as a stack. Okay, so this is a comment about second part of this sentence. Now, what about these D modules? Now, actually, when we work, uh, so when I say D modules, you can also say that this is like looking at algebraic systems of partial differential equations on this gadget. Or if you like, there's a also quasi-coherent sheaves with connections, with flat connections. So curvature is zero. So, um, my point is that 
there are several geometric counterparts for the notion of function, and this is only one of them. It's definitely my favorite, but um, up to a certain point, if you like, you can work with uh, maybe if you're more familiar with things like constructible sheaves or um, well, ideally perverse sheaves. Um, to begin with, you can deal with, the, uh, you can work with them, but by the end of uh, by the end of today's talk, I will actually have to work with D modules. It will be important, and I, I'm tempted to say that this D modular thing is maybe is really the reason why I'm assuming characteristic zero. The theory of D modules can be done in any characteristic, but somehow in characteristic zero, it's much nicer. All right, so, so this is what happens on, what uh, hap uh, this is the object of study on the automorphic side of the geometric Langlands conjecture. Now roughly, what is the statement? Roughly speaking, the statement is that uh, we want to construct a nice family of automorphic objects. So I want to say that they, they have to be in some sense very nice, they have to be special, uh, maybe in the same sense as functions sometimes are called special functions. And uh, they also have to form somehow uh, form a basis or something close to the basis in um, in the space of functions. So our goal classically would be to do some kind of functional analysis here, find, say, so something analogous to finding exponential functions and then writing Fourier series. So let me start by writing this rough goal is to find a family of special, oops, in some sense, well, geometrically I will be looking at D modules rather than functions, I don't care, family of special D modules on this stack of vector bundles, and then we want to say that in some sense this, um, uh, this family will be will form a basis. Let me actually put quotation marks around these two words because neither of those was explained even to the extent to which everything else in this statement was explained. So we'll have to get back to it and try to make sense of it. Okay, now let me, now basically the rest of today is trying to make this statement more and more precise. And the um, first kind of correction that I want to, or Another, I guess, addition to this is, well, this family has to be indexed somehow, and so this family will be indexed by um, objects on the, of a different nature. These are the guys on the Galois side of the geometric Langlands conjecture, and so this family will be indexed by local systems on, um, on X. So now time to make more definitions. So this definition is, this is, maybe I should 
put on top that this is now on the Galois side of the um, on the Galois side of the geometric Langlands conjecture, we will be looking at rank n. So rank n local systems on our Riemann surface X. And uh, there are, well, several people, different people understand different things by this, uh, by local system. So when I say local system, I mean what could be called the RAM local system. So in other words, it's the same as a rank N vector bundle on X equipped with a connection, well, flat connection. If, if you think algebraically, it's automatically flat because X is one dimension. So if it's an algebraic, let me just put flat there anyways, with a flat connection. So classically, I guess, if you choose coordinates, you can think of this as a system of n linear ordinary differential equations. But also, there's a, this, the point is that these objects are essentially topological because when we have a system of differential equations, it's really the interesting invariant and in some sense the only invariant is its monodromy. And so this thing is going to be given um, let me say that maybe classically I would be looking at the representations of the fundamental group and dimensional representations of the fundamental group of X. And of course fundamental group is just some view, one of those incarnations of the Galois group, so which is why the name is appropriate. So, I'm going to, uh, before I forget, so unfortunately I'm out of room. So let me call by LS just the uh, set of all local systems of this type. So of rank N on X in this sense. All right, so I think to, uh, I can already summarize maybe roughly what's going on. So now the two sides of the um, uh, conjecture already started to appear. And the important thing is as palm is they have a different nature somehow that on one side, we're looking at what might be called geometric objects on X. So we look at vector bundles. And I want to say that these actually depend on the holomorphic. So if I think of a Riemann surface, this depends on the holomorphic structure. On the other hand, these local systems are really topological objects. So they, uh, because of the fact that you have look at vector bundles with a flat connection, it's determined by represent by its monodromy, so basically by the topology of X. So somehow, um, uh, well, at first, so this is, well, you can say the duality between the two sides and on one side objects. We start by looking at geometric objects on the other side we'll start at, by looking at topological objects. And I didn't mean to use geometry as a antonym of topology, but it just happened. Uh, all right. So now let's see how all of this works in an example. So this is maybe the second. Um, second part of today's 
uh, talk. So the example that goes by the name of a, cl a geometric class field theory which where um, we set n equals to 1. And so, so what happens when n is equal to 1? Well, first of all, uh, rank 1 bundles are just line bundles. And so the space of line bundles is this famous object called a Jacobian. of x and in the spirit of making things kind of not 100% precise I will ignore the fact that there are line bundles of degree higher than zero until I actually need it and then I'll stop ignoring it. So, so this is um, um, and our goal is to construct some kind of D modules on this, uh, on J. And this D modules as the input for this construction. So the stuff that we feed in into the uh, geometric Langlands correspondence to get a D module should be a local system on X, more specifically a rank one local system. So stat and from a rank one, they change color, is it? Starting from a rank one local system L on X, we want to construct a, um, an automorphic object, that is to say, a D module on J. So. I'll denote it by odd L, which is a D module on J. And so and um, If we think about local systems in terms of their monodromies, this is particularly easy to describe. So let me say that L is given by its monodromy, which I'll denote by the monodromy of L, which is a one-dimensional representation of the fundamental group of X. Now, the fundamental group of X is something complicated, but because it's a one-dimensional representation, it actually factors through. So any non-trivial commutator goes to zero. Let me just write this. So I, I might as well pass from this group to its abelianization, which is the same as the first homology of X, and from this point of view, the key observation is that this also happens to be the fundamental group of um, this complex torus of this Jacobian of X. And so because of, so you can say that again, from this point of view, this equality is the geometric Langlands conjecture. So, namely, what happens is that because of this equality, if I have a, a, a one-dimensional representation of the fundamental group of X, it automatically comes from a one-dimensional representation of this quotient, which is also uh, one, which is also the fundamental group of J, and so we can just define. Oops, I don't know why I changed that. We can just define the 
um, corresponding D module to be uh, the rank one local, local system. on J, whose monodromy is obtained from the starting monodromy by means of this diagram. So it's rank one local system on J, such that, um, well, it's the monodromy of this rank one local system is this composition. So, All right, so now this is the way the correspondence, well, this may be the shortest way to describe the correspondence of the class field theory, of the geometric class field theory. And let me say that, well, maybe the magic that happens is that generally speaking, so if you have a, D module, generally speaking, it could be something quite complicated. It doesn't need to look the same at all points. So you can have different dimensions of fibers at different points. In other words, in fact, it's just a quasi-coherent sheaf with a connection. And it just, so the big advantage of this case, of, Ren, of class field theory case, is that the D module turns out to be uh, just a local system that underlies, so you just have a rank one bundle with connections, no tricky quasi-coherent sheaves anywhere. And because of this, you can actually, you just need to, uh, so for, for local systems, you uh, can construct them by means of, I guess, the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence uh, by looking at their monodromy. And this is what we did here. So, and I guess another way of uh, saying basically the same thing is that the Jacobian is, well, it's a torus. It kind of looks the same at all points. It's something very homogeneous. So it's no surprise that uh, if we want to construct some nice objects on it, they are going to look nice everywhere. So like an exponential function is equally smooth at all points. Uh, in for higher ends, this will no longer be the case. So, um, th and this is the reason why uh, anything larger, so n equals one is truly exceptional. So class field theory is much easier than um, Langland's conjecture. Okay, so hopefully this made at least some sense. And let me apologize once again for cheating slightly by saying that, by kind of ignoring the components in bond, but it's all, there, there's really, it's not that hard to actually fix this, so this is cheating sort of for a good cause. Okay, so now let me actually let me actually close this up because in a sense this is misleading. So it was nice while we had it, now it's gone. So let's go back to, the, uh, to our goal. Let's go back to the formulation and let me try to uh, maybe clarify some things. So namely, let me talk about what special properties do I actually want from this. So what's special about this odd app? So, in what way are this special this out L special? So let me just to make sure the notations 
are clear. So L is now a local system. On, uh, on a Riemann surface, we started with, um, in, in the example, it was rank one, but I'm also wanting an answer in general. And from this, we are supposed to get a D module. And I want to explain at least what, what should be nice about this D module. So the answer, first of all, the keywords, the answer is that it must have something called Hecke eigen property, that it, in, it should be in some sense an eigenvector of natural operators. And roughly speaking, let's go back to the case, to this example, n equals 1. So when n is equal to 1, it's easiest to express uh, the kind of symmetry that these uh, modules must have, these uh, automorphic objects must have. So basically, if I fix a point, fix a point x on my, uh, um, so if I fix a point on the Riemann surface, then it uh, gives me a natural operation on line bundles, namely I can twist line bundles. So it gives, a map from um, from the Picard scheme to itself, I guess, which just takes any line bundle, let me call it E to avoid confusion uh, with the local system. So you take E and twist it by this point X. Now, if you want to think about it in, um, well, if you uh, want to do this, you actually have to, you can, you're not allowed to fix the degree of the line bundle. If you still want to fix the degree of the line bundle, you can maybe subtract some other point to make sure the degree stays constant. Anyway, so the point is that uh, you have a bunch of natural symmetries of this, um, of this space. And our objects are supposed to be homogeneous under these symmetries. So if I was uh, looking at just functions, then I would say that I'm interested in a function such that if I shift it, then it's, well, maybe in an ideal world it would stay invariant, or at the very least it would stay, uh, it would be an eigenvector, so it will scale under this translation. So, in fact, let me actually say that classically, you can um, think about it as follows, that um, on this space, you have um, an, the action of such translations. So let me call this just H. And then I'll denote the translation by X. I'll denote it by TX. So I have a, a symmetry of this space. And then my goal is to uh, uh, look for eigenvectors of this family of operators in the space of functions. So, so operators of, say, pullback under this symmetry 
where x runs over all possible points. They act on the space of functions and our goal is to do um, our goal is to uh, do the harmonic analysis, so to find their common to find their common eigenvectors and eigenvalues while we're at it. So, or in fact, I guess the point is that the automorphic object that we are constructing should exactly be uh, eigenvectors of this um, of these operators, of these translation operators. So, um, perhaps I do have time, so let me actually uh, say this, how this works out geometrically, um, still in this example n equals 1, so still within uh, the class field theory world. So, So, and the main thing about this uh, working geometrically, well, there are two things. First of all, you have to somehow uh, be comfortable with uh, passing from functions to geometric objects such as D modules. So, you need to know that uh, main things you can do for functions like pullbacks or um, now, in this case, you just need the pullback. Uh, then there is a similar operation for D modules. Um, this is kind of the tools that go into this. And then there's also, an, um, there's also a nice trick. Namely, it turns out that it's better to, instead of trying to look at these operators individually, it's better to deal with them in the family. So to look at all of them at the same time. So here's how this example, so continuation of this example in the geometric world will work out as follows. So let me call by T the, what somehow the universal shift uh, on, the, uh, on the Picard scheme. So now I have X, let me, I will keep running bun just for consistency, but um, if you want, you can also write pick for the, for the Picard scheme of X. So, so we have such a universal operation which sends X to, so starting from a point and the line bundle, we modify it at this particular point just by twisting it up. And so if I fix uh, the first coordinate, then it just becomes the translation. And uh, the claim is that, or the claim or the property that I want these objects to have is that the following Hecke Eigen property Namely, if I start, let me write them. So if I start with this, um, so uh, this atomorphic local system, if I, if I pull back, if I uh, see what this universal shift does to it, then I'm supposed to get itself, the system I started with, up to a certain scaling, and the scaling depends on the point um, that I'm shifting by, and in fact, sort of, I want to say the coefficient 
with which a point appears is exactly given by the local system I started with. So, so this is somehow the main identity. Notice that if I fix if I fix the first coordinate, if I fix point in X, then on the right, I'm just shifting the automorphic uh, local system by TX. And on the left, it says that I'm supposed to have the same automorphic local system tensor the fiber of this, of the local system L at this point. So this, in particular, this says that, I guess I shouldn't try to fit it here. So, so this is a clever way of saying or maybe a universal way of saying this. So, but somehow it contains more information because if I just write this, it tells you that if you take your local system and you pull it back, you get the same local system tensor something, but this something is a one-dimensional vector space. So all one-dimensional vector spaces are isomorphic, so by itself, this does not tell you much. Now, this clever way tells you that if you actually keep track of which one dimensional space you get, and the best way to keep track of it is to see how it varies with the point, then you get something more interesting. You get rank one local system on your curve. And in fact, not, so, so this is the way to normalize the correspondence between uh, local system, rank one local systems on X and on one by saying that the eigenvalues that you look at should be exactly mm. uh, the eigenvalue that you get for. So uh, once again, I'm thinking of uh, this property expressing the being like the eigenproperty of this guy with L being the eigenvalue. And so this is the normalization. We want uh, the automorphic object to be an eigen object uh, with eigenvalue being given by L. Okay. You got me. So here, I, um, I mean, if it's easiest here to look at the entire Picard scheme. So not just one Jacobian, but countably many components. Is that the question? Okay. So when I write equal, I mean that there is a canonical isomorphism. So I want a canonical isomorphism. If you like, you, it should be, you, I should, I guess if I really wanted to, I should have said that the real correspondence should assign to L this guy together with an isomorphism like this, and maybe a whole bunch of other isomorphisms. Now, so in other words, I'm comfortable writing this, but I'm not comfortable writing this. Like if I had this, I would write non-canonical isomorphism here. Even though the fact, even though this is a rank one, um, even though this is a dimension one vector space, which is isomorphic to C, but not canonical. Any other questions? All right, now, so what happens when, now what changes if rank increases? Well, the main thing is that, mm, we now have more complicated, if you have something other than a line bundle, but a vector bundle, you have more complicated ways of um, changing it at a point. So these are just simple twists. You just twist it by a point, but these, there's in some sense too few to normalize the correspondence in any meaningful way. And so what this means is that 
we would have to consider more complicated operations. Now let me just, so to, um, I could go basically, repeat the same steps, but let me try jump into the universal picture immediately. So, and hopefully it will make at least some sense. So, so what happens now when N is no longer one. So what if, what happens in general? So let me uh, consider the answer is given by a geometric construction that I'll call the universal Hecke correspondence. And, well, it's a, it's a correspondence not in the sense of Langlands correspondence, but rather in the sense of a generalization of the notion of function. So it's a, um, it's a space equipped with a bunch of maps to other spaces. So namely, I'll call it just Hecke, and this will be, this will parameterize the following objects. It consists of a, um, a vector bundle, another vector bundle, so these are both vector bundles of the same rank. Um, I don't need n because it, n is fixed for me. And a map between them, which is, it's an isomorphism away from one point, and at this one point it's as close to being an isomorphism as possible without actually being one. So more precisely this, so you have an injective map of sheaves and the quotient is a length one sheaf supported at one point. So this thing has length one sheaf at the point X. But this point X is not fixed. So when I was dealing with line bundles, this would be just a fancy way of saying that one line bundle is obtained from the other by twisting um, at this point, but for vector bundles there are many different such modifications even at a fixed point because you can enlarge your vector bundle in different directions. For example, if this E is a direct sum of say two line bundles, this says you can twist one of them at this point, you can twist the other one at this point, or you can twist something in between these two line bundles at this point. Anyway, so in fact, there will be uh, a whole projective space of different, uh, of such modifications if you fix vector bundle E and the point X. So, so for higher N, there is some, something more interesting is going on. And now, there will be, now I have two projections from this that I obtained by forgetting some data. So, for instance, I can uh, go to x times bun by forgetting E1 and keeping a, a vector bundle and the point. So this thing will map to x. On the other hand, I have a different map to bun which actually remembers the, um, just remembers the 
larger of the two vector bundles. So, so none of these maps, uh, so the, the, what I said earlier about the special case n equals one amounts to saying that if n is equal to one, then the map P is an isomorphism. So E1 is uniquely reconstructable from E and X. For other ends, the this map is a projective vibration. For, for higher n, this is a projective vibration. Okay. Now, now let me write the uh, Hecke eigen property that I want to ask from this Langlands. Uh, uh, well, from the automorphic sheaves, automorphic D modules that appear in the Langlands, in the Langlands conjecture. So, this is maybe the um, the main. Maybe the main formula that I can write um, uh, today. So, so I want um, the automorphic D module associated to a local system to have have the following property. So, if I put, consider it. On, on this bun and then follow along this diagram. So I pull back, well, it's a D module, so technically probably should write this kind of D uh, this kind of pullback. So if I follow along this diagram, then the result is going, has to be itself along uh, the complicated directions, and then you get some scaling along x, which is, so these are like eigenvalues given by, um, given by the local system that we started with. Now, I think I have about two or three minutes, so I'm not going to say anything meaningful, but let me just informally, let me say what, roughly speaking, what this, uh, what this formula is about. So our, first of all, let me actually, uh, for the formula it's nice to work universally, but for explanation it, I would prefer to fix a point x. And so if I fix a point, then I'm looking at the following diagram. So I'm just looking at pairs of vector bundles that are obtained by such elementary modification at a fixed point. And so let's pretend for a moment that I'm working with a function. So then, if I'm working with functions, then, uh, so and instead of such uh, operations on D modules, I would be thinking about pull back and push forward of a function. This would then this would correspond to the following operation on functions. So I have a um, so I start with the function on vector bundles, and then I transform it, and the value of the new function is the sum of the values of the old function at all modifications of a given vector bundle. So you can think of it as a kind of a graph. So you think so again. Think of it if you think of it discreetly. So this is maybe the picture of bun FQ. So these are all different vector bundles, and then you connect, well, in this case, I'm thinking of it as an oriented graph. So you draw an arrow from E to E1. If E1, so this is E, this is E1. I draw an arrow if E1 is an upper modification of E. There are many upper modifications, well, 
as many as points in the projective space over uh, FQ. So, and well, in the same, you, you will get the same more than once, again, the same number of times. And so, once you have such a thing, you can try to do kind of harmonic analysis with respect to this, on this graph. So, and which means that you look at the operation of, you could, classically I would probably look at averaging rather than just summation over all neighbors, but it doesn't really matter. So, if you have a function, you can add it up over all the neighbors and put this number here. And this, the condition is that we are interested in functions that are eigen operators of such, um, that are, sorry, that are eigenvalue, uh, eigen functions of such operators. So this is the setup now only done in a more, in a different framework. So you have to work with D modules and in fact, if you really, mm, you really need to work with the derived categories of D modules at this, uh, although at this point it's not maybe completely necessary, but more on this next time. All right, I hope. <laughs>